Do you know what time it is? It's Supernatural Story Time. And if you're easily scared, and even if you're not, there's only one thing left to do. Just turn off the lights, because these are stories that you listen to only in the dark. The Black Dog. Imagine if you can a creature with fur so black it appears almost as a void. Each strand of fur, actually a black quill with enough venom to bring down the largest prey. It stands on four powerful legs that propel it through the night, both swiftly and silently. The muscles of its jaws capable of forcing the knife-like teeth through bone as easily as breathing. The decay within this creature's mouth is so rotten that even a scratch from a single tooth causes necrosis. Now, imagine this beast could disguise itself as a common animal, a pet even, a black dog that could belong to anyone. Imagine yourself alone in the forest, a voice of a child or lost lover catches your ear from somewhere in the distance. Upon investigation, you find not another human, but a big black dog, seemingly harmless but for the fear that grips your heart. This beast of a canine lifts his head to look at you. Two piercing red eyes glare into the depths of your soul. Come, you hear a voice say, and the dog leads you further from safety and deeper into imminent peril. Drawn by an unknown force, you follow until you are in the darkest part of the woods, surrounded by ancient trees. The dog stops and looks to you once again. Before you stands Black Shuck, and you are about to die. He lets out a deadly ear-splitting howl that sounds like all the souls in hell crying out in one accord. When his eyes find yours once again, you stare into not two but three bright red eyes They close the distance until only the horrible crimson covers your vision. Then you wake to the clawing and gnashing of teeth. You wake to sulfur and brimstone. You wake quite literally in hell. You've stood before black shuck, and you are dead. Thirteen days earlier, I was in the library studying the different evolutions of lycanthropy when the porcelain man interrupted. He handed me a stack of unsolved murders. On top of the file... There was an article concerning black dog sightings throughout the UK. I flipped through the notes quickly and looked up at him quizzically. Are you saying that all of these people were killed by dogs? I'm supposed to hunt dogs? What do you know of hellhounds? A gloved finger tapped on a page of a book. I didn't even notice what was on the desk. It was a journal entry from the 700s describing a large black dog that preceded the Vikings' attack at Northumbria. It detailed the death it wrought, describing the beast as a wolf straight from hell, with fur that had been scorched black and eyes of pure red. Its howl was said to herald death, as the Vikings followed wherever it went, slaughtering hundreds. When the Vikings reached the monastery, however, the hellhound turned on them and devoured them all. As the priests and monks began to praise God, The demon dog let out a deadly roar and tore the men of faith to pieces, save one who wrote the tale. He dubbed the creature Black Shuck. So I set out for the mainland to see what I could find. The first thing I did was crop my hair and shaved. I needed to look like a proper gentleman if I was going to learn anything from the Vic's next of kin. Arriving at the first house, on the list my shiny new detective inspector badge and best proper London accent ready. I put on a solemn face and knocked. I was greeted by the victim's widower and ushered inside. I was surprised by the elegance of the interior. While from the outside the house was nearly identical to the rest of the suburban neighborhood, it was vastly more extravagant on the inside. As it turns out, the man had received a vast inheritance when the body of his late wife was found silver lining I supposed I didn't learn much from the man aside from the fact that he didn't even know she had this kind of money until his lawyer read the will he said that he didn't even know she had a will so she had a secret account and never touched it 
simply signing it over to him in the event of her death, as if she knew she was going to and planned accordingly. I remembered reading that hellhounds are often used to collect payment when someone makes a deal with a demon. Maybe she made a deal for the money, and this was collection. Not really worth my time if this demon dog is only doing its job, right? If she made the deal, she's got to pay the price. I headed next to the public records section of the library to connect the dots. If all of the victims were rich or extremely lucky, then it would be a closed case. A demon in town making deals and collecting. No crime there, though I was inclined to ask him to slow down. Of the seven victims in the last year, two had won some sweepstakes or another two had inherited fortunes from long-lost relatives. One had gone from nobody to opera sensation and another became an internet sensation. The last one was strange. Honestly, a bit of a push. Who sells their soul for internet fame? The final victim was a complete mystery, a John Smith. John Doe for us Americans. Who had been torn apart by a large animal with no known match in a bite pattern resembling an overlarge canine. He wasn't eaten, though. No missing flesh at all, just torn up and spat back out. I needed to find an ID for the body. I made my way to the morgue as the body had yet to be claimed. I was nervous about impersonating a cop to other cops. I'd practiced before on a rant trying to convince the local police force I was a cop from London on holiday. But this wasn't going to be quite so easy. I walked in like I was meant to be there, walked straight through following the sign for the morgue, trying not to stop. I made it without incident, surprisingly. As I flashed my badge to the technician and asked to see the body, he stared at me quizzically. Shit, my accent sucks. I was made. You're the bloomin' second heap of coke today. Your partner or something? Wait, what? That'd be too cliche to happen in real life, right? I nodded and he buzzed me through. Committed now to this foolish mistake, I approached the other cop. What have we got? I asked in my best RP accent. I startled her and she turned toward me in a defensive manner. I noticed her eyes were a bit moist as if she had been on the verge of tears. You're not a carp, are you? I asked her knowing full well that neither of us was. One beetle recognizes another. She retorted in a beautiful Irish accent. If that hadn't given away her ethnicity, her bright red hair and green eyes certainly spelled it out. It was difficult to figure how she'd fooled the tech into letting her in here until she smiled. One flash of her pearly whites and any red-blooded man would have given her the world to see it again. She questioned me. Yeah, I'll be having something. Total double entendre, my accent failing. No sense in keeping up the pretense anymore. Who was this man and what happened to him? After a few minutes of back and forth questioning, it was made clear that the John Smith on the table was one Trenton O'Connor, the lovely young Irish woman's father. We decided that this wasn't the best place to discuss shop, and we moved to a more private, non-illegal venue. As it turns out, Sibon went by Charlie and her father Trenton were hunters. In fact, the entire O'Connor family was. I say was intentionally. Charlie was the last surviving member of her family. Her father had last been hunting a creature that called itself Reynard in the area where he was found dead, mutilated beyond a normal animal attack. You could see the anger and rage of this beast in the horror that was left. She knew Reynard was involved in her father's death, but was unconvinced it had done the deed itself. This wasn't a creature style. This was something worse by far. I showed her the research into the black dogs and black shuck, and her face went white. She'd heard the name before. We decided to hunt together, hoping to increase our chances of bagging this baddie. And yes, since you are all thinking it, it conveniently increased the chances of my hormonal ass ending up in her bed. And after a week of hunting, that hope came to reality. I'm sure I remember it differently than she does, but the time we had was amazing. Hunting with her all night and fucking all day. It was heaven to a 19-year-old. Ten days into the hunt, we found the end of her father's trail. Black Shuck had dumped his body, 
certainly in several trips miles away from where he'd actually killed them. Once we followed the clues to the original scene, we set up a blind and waited for our prey. Unfortunately, we had been prey all along. I had a strange feeling for most of the hunt that we were being watched, but it wasn't until all sound in the forest died out that I knew we were in trouble. I stepped out of the blind and climbed into the nearest tree to get a better vantage. That's when I heard the whisper. I couldn't make it out, but I definitely heard the answer. Charlie almost in a whimper asking, Da? Is that your? The whisper grew louder and Charlie answered by tearing off into the woods. I called after her and struggled to get down from the tree quickly without falling. I jumped the last ten feet, twisting my ankle as I landed. I ran after Charlie as best I could, pain shooting through my leg with each step. I could hear Charlie calling for her dad. I tried to call her back, but it was as if she couldn't hear me at all. Finally, I heard a scream that was cut off way too fast. I burst into a clearing and there stood a mammoth of a dog, eyes like saucers glowing bright red. Within his massive jaws, Charlie hunk limply by her upper torso, her fiery mop of curls mixed with crimson oozing from between the monster's teeth. He worked his jaws slowly closed. Charlie's eyes snapped open as she tried to scream. Blood gurgled from her lips instead of sound. Time seemed to slow. Green eyes met my own gray orbs, and the look broke my soul. More than that, it broke all sense of fear and self-preservation. I flew at the canine horror, and he dropped his chew toy, lips curling upward into a sort of grinning snarl. It bounded over me and made for the edge of the clearing. By some unknown force of will or adrenaline, I sprang onto the beast's back, tackling it to the ground. Each strand of fur I touched pierced right through the fabric of my clothes, and into my very flesh. I let out a howl of pain and rage, trying to hold on. I remember my back striking a tree, and the crack my skull made as it thumped soon after. My eyes eased open slowly to see a figure hovering over Charlie's body. I was sure she was dead, and I struggled toward her. Before my very eyes, a light came from the unknown figure and overtook Charlie. I was about to scream at the stranger, but as the light died out, Charlie sat up, gasping, choking on the blood still in her throat, but she was breathing nonetheless. I forced myself to sit up against the nearest tree. Relief washed over me. The stranger turned my way and made its way toward me. As it approached, my eyes began to focus. The form took the shape of a woman, curvaceous and tight. I swore I was seeing an angel until she got close enough for me to make out details. Beautiful as she was, the short plaid skirt and red button-up shirt that was a size or too small were testament against her innocence. She stood close and examined me for a moment. You should be dead, but since you're not, go kill that son of a bitch. She placed a gladius doll machete in my lap and rubbed my shaved head. As she stood, I noticed a tattoo peeking over the waistline of her low-rise skirt. It was in the form of two wolves, one white, one black, devouring each other in a sort of yin-yang. She hoisted the smaller red head to her feet and led her out of the forest. I pushed myself to my feet and shook the dizziness off. I gripped the handle tight and forced one foot in front of the other. Each step came a little easier until I was nearly running through the woods. When the noise suddenly cut out again, I knew I was on the right track. Draco, I heard the porcelain man's voice whisper. A smirk broke the sternness of my face as I thought about the situation. This beast was nearly as frightening as the home. Draco, it whispered again. No, I answered back, you chase me. I took off, running toward a tight grouping of trees where his gargantuan size would be at a disadvantage. Draco, another voice echoed off the trees. Not in a Hume's, but familiar all the same, a voice I hadn't heard in years, but knew as I knew my own. In fact, it was my own, and wasn't. It was his, the demon I had first encountered so many years ago. I stopped dead in my tracks. I froze, fear gripping my heart again. I don't know how long I stood there, but a heavy blow to my left side and a sharp sting to my cheek brought me out of my stupor just in time to slash wildly at my attacker. 
There was a yelp followed by a menacing growl. I rolled back to my feet and could feel blood running down my chin, dripping on my shirt. I brought the machete to an offensive stance and stared into three bright red eyes. Across his side, Crimson stood out proudly against black armor-like fur. For two years I prepared for this. Two years I've readied my mind and body for this very purpose. Black lips curled back, revealing a mouthful of daggers. A snarl that caused my very core to shake in fear emanated from that dark form before me. My hand gripped the handle of my knife tighter, my knuckles turning white. The snarl transformed into a growl of pure hatred. I found my chest reverberating with my own feral cry. He leapt. I leapt. Teeth came down. All my knife came up. Blood, hot and slick, painting our bodies crimson. Vile toxic teeth missed their mark by mere centimeters. On my blade found purchase in the soft fur just below the beast's chin. He whimpered pathetically, thrashing hysterically. My blade twisted sharply and his movement cut completely. Ruby eyes dulled. A look of hurt, not pain, but hurt pierced my soul. Those optics closed slowly as the beast's death rattle vibrated through canine nostrils for a final time. I dug a hole deep enough for the beast, who in death looked almost like a big puppy. Before laying his body down, I took off his head and placed it backward in the grave, a silver crucifix placed inside his jaws. I dropped two old shillings in the grave and covered the beast with dirt, a dash of holy water for good measure, and I stumbled my way back out of the forest. I made my way back to the hotel room. Charlie and I were sharing to find a note. I've gone to tend to my da's remains. Don't want him coming back, do we? I chuckled, certain I'd see her again. After a shower and some bandages, I left the hotel, intending to track down my demon. The one I assume was making the deals. The Loop Guru My grandmother's farm was situated on 15 acres of land north of Hayden, Alabama. It was several hours from our home, and we would make the drive there a handful of times a year, mostly in the summer. I can remember the anticipation I would feel as we drove up the long driveway to find the modest house, which my grandfather, Elmer, had built with his bare hands, perched atop the hill. Picturing it now, I see the rusted tin roof, the weathered porch, and the dilapidated barn that stood out back. As a child, none of that mattered to us, obviously. We spent our days roaming the rolling countryside, swimming in a nearby creek, and playing on the old oak that grew beside the house, whose branches were so large they scraped the ground. The fields surrounding the farmhouse were no longer fertile, providing ample space for us to properly conduct the adventures we concocted in our minds and were surrounded by the dense forest of the Alabama countryside. I always cherished the time I spent with my grandmother. When we were inside, she was always singing to us, telling us stories about when she was a girl, teaching us how to make things out of sticks and string, and passing down the type of random wisdom that only a grandmother can. Unfortunately, I never knew my grandfather. My grandmother said he died in a hunting accident when I was very young. I heard so much about him from her and my parents, however, that I felt like I knew him. He was a large man, strong as an ox, my grandmother would say, who had farmed the field from sun up to sundown without so much as a whisper of complaint. My grandmother, her family of Cajun descent, had met my grandfather at school in Louisiana, and the two had moved out to this land, left to them by Elmer's uncle to start a life together. My mother had been born in this very farmhouse. I respected my grandmother more than any other person on the earth, but she was not without her quirks, the strangest of which was her insistence that we follow three specific rules as long as we were there. I can remember her pulling my sister and I close, kissing us on the forehead and gently reminding us about them each time we arrived, her frail and wrinkled hands cradling ours. Don't leave food outside. No singing past dark. And most importantly, never go into the woods. She never explained why they were important, only that they were important. The rules were something we rarely questioned. Grandma said to follow them, so we did. Simple as that. The first two were pretty easy. 
I wasn't much of a singer and we didn't have food outside unless my grandmother had given it to us. But the third was a bit more challenging. Her property was surrounded by woods on all sides with a buffer of several hundred yards between the house and the tree line. And my sister and I were often tempted to go exploring within. We'd ask permission, stating our ages as proof that we were responsible and could take care of ourselves. Without fail, she would always reply, The rules are for your safety, Shah. You mustn't break them. Shah is a Cajun word that means dear. For the sake of clarity, I'm translating the rest of her Cajun speak into regular English for this account. I can remember one evening, when my sister was only three or four years old, when she accidentally left some food outside. We had been eating bologna sandwiches on the back steps. I remember we both liked our smash down and cut into little squares. Having finished mine, I had gone inside to get something to drink and she had followed me, leaving her plate behind. Later that night, we were all in front of the fireplace curled up in Grandma's lap under one of her large quilts, telling stories and laughing when we heard something scratching at the back door. Immediately, I felt her body tense underneath me and she shot a glance over to my father who was sitting on the floor. He tried to keep his face blank, but I could see the worry creeping through. What is that, Grandma? I asked. Probably just a raccoon, my father said, starting to stand. Sha, let me, Grandma said. My father picked us up from her lap, gently placing us on the floor as she made her way to the back of the house. A few moments later, she walked back into the den and sat back down. She was holding my sister's empty plate from earlier. When my sister saw the plate and the look on my grandmother's face, she burst into tears. It's okay, she said, hugging my sister tightly. Let's do our best not to do this again, okay? Later that night, when everyone was in bed, I crept out from beneath the covers and tiptoed to the back door. It was open. I don't think the house had air conditioning, and the doors were often left open, with the screen doors closed to keep the bugs out. I was old enough to be curious about what had happened earlier, and young enough to not be scared about what I might find. There was a single bulb above the back door that cast a narrow beam of light that illuminated the back steps. On the top two steps, bathed in the airy light of the dim bulb, were dozens of long black hairs. After the food incident, I became a bit more aware about the things that happened around the farmhouse and started to have the notion that my grandmother was hiding something. I wasn't sure what it was, but whatever was at the back door was a part of it. The next year, my sister and I found a dead deer about 50 yards in from the tree line. I think it was a deer at least. Its head was completely missing and its body was completely mutilated. Even at my young age, I knew no other animal had done that. When I told my grandmother about it, rather than being shocked, she acted as if it was commonplace, saying to stay away from it and my father would take it somewhere. The next year, there was one night where we were all woken by something banging around in the barn. In the morning, when we went out to investigate, it was clear that someone had vandalized it. One of the barn doors was completely ripped off of the front and everything inside was torn apart like someone was looking for something. Grandma said it must have been thieves looking for iron to scrap. But what thief would go looking for iron in a barn in the middle of nowhere? Later that same trip, as I was playing on the old oak, I noticed my sister had strayed rather close to the tree line. The next thing I knew, I saw my father sprinting across the field towards her. When he reached her, he grabbed her, threw her over his shoulder, and sprinted back towards the farmhouse. He had scared the shit out of her, so I guessed that's why she was crying hysterically. But my father never would say why he had to get her away from there so quickly. There were other incidents like that over the years, but what they meant in some, I had never figured out. The last time I visited my grandmother's farm was the summer I turned 16. It was the summer my grandmother finally told me about the secret she had been keeping for so long. At 16, as most kids are, I was pretty defiant. I still had great respect for my grandmother, don't get me wrong, but I was growing a bit tired of the seemingly arbitrary nature of her rules, especially the third one. Never going to the woods? What was I, five? By that time, I had basically run out of things to do at the farm and why desperately to explore the woods I had been barred from entering for so long. So one day I did. 
It was an exceptionally hot July day and I decided to follow a little creek that wound through the corner of her property into the woods. The foliage was dense and unforgiving, blocking out much of the sun and providing much needed respite from the heat. I kicked my shoes off and began walking along the creek's sandy bank, losing myself in the hum of the water as it rushed around various sticks and stones and the chatter of the birds and insects around me. When I had gone far enough that I couldn't see the tree line, I noticed that aside from the sound of the water, I couldn't hear the sound of the sounds of the birds or insects any longer. The forest had become deathly silent. The air was unnaturally still, creating an odd sense of uneasiness within me. Never forgetting my grandmother's warnings and believing I had somehow worn out my welcome, I hastily turned to head back to the farmhouse. I stopped when I heard the crack of a branch far off in the distance behind me. Afraid to look back, I started walking again. A few steps later, I heard it again. It was the sound of someone or something moving through dense underbrush in my direction. I turned slowly and what I saw scared the living shit out of me. In the distance, I saw a silhouette of some lumbering beast walking towards me through the forest. It was tall, over six feet, and looked mostly like a man, except there appeared to be ears sprouting from the top of its dark head. I could see its eyes, large and yellow, shining at me even though the rest of its head was shrouded in darkness. I stumbled backwards, falling into the sandy water, then turned and tore through the woods, sprinting over rocks and pine cones and briars in a mad dash to escape whatever was coming for me. I didn't even bother stopping to grab my shoes. When I made it back to the farmhouse, I slammed the outer door and locked it shut, then ran inside to find my grandmother. I found her sitting at the kitchen table, preparing some beans for dinner. I was a mess. I was covered in sweat, wet and sandy, and I'm sure my eyes belied my terror. When she looked up at me, she could tell immediately that something had happened. Were you in the woods? was all she asked. I'm sorry, Grandma, I didn't know. There was a thing. Uh, I stumbled over my words, not sure exactly what to say to her. Instead of being angry, she looked at me with sadness in her eyes and motioned for me to come and sit beside her. My foot was bleeding, and once she had bandaged it up, she began to tell me a story. The loop guru is what you saw. It's also called the Rugaru, outside of Louisiana, I believe. My mother used to tell me the tales about a monster, part man and part wolf, that would roam the swamps around her home and snatch children who had strayed too far from their parents. A children's fable, surely, which I never really believed it to be true, yet the story still scared me. It wasn't until we moved here to farm that I realized it wasn't just a story. Your grandfather, on one of his hunting trips, found the carcass of an animal that had been ripped to shreds beyond recognition. He hunted the animal he believed had caused it, thinking it was a bear, and finally tracked it to its den deep in the forest. It was no bear, child. Your grandfather described it as a man with long, dark hair covering his body, yet with the head of a wolf, just like the stories. The two fought your grandfather prevailing, but not before being gravely injured. Several hours after he came back that night, a sickness overtook him. He wailed and moaned in his sleep that night, and in the morning his eyes had sunken into his head, and the hair on his body had started to grow long and deep and black. A few hours later he was gone. I guess he had realized what was happening and didn't want to endanger me. The thing you saw today in the forest, child, that was your grandfather. My heart was broken, having lost the only man I had ever loved. I didn't know how to cope with it. I would sit out on the back steps and sing old songs my mother used to sing to me, and I would see him, it, creep out of the forest to listen, only coming close enough to show me that he was there. I would leave food out on the back steps at night, and he would come and eat, always licking the plate clean. I don't think the transformation was fully complete then. Your grandfather was still there inside, somewhere. I hoped he could somehow come back from whatever he had become. Then I started to hear the howling and find the dead animals. That's when I knew your grandfather was gone. The rules, now you can see, are meant to protect you, child. He is drawn to the food and to the singing, 
still remembering how I comforted him during those early days. And anything that goes into the woods doesn't come out alive. I'm thankful you're here. This must be your last trip here, child. Now that he has seen you up close, you have a taste for your blood, and he won't stop until he drains every last bit from your body. Your grandfather has several guns here, but I dare not use them, and I caution you to heed this warning. I see the look in your eyes. If you did succeed in killing him, I fear you would face the same fate as your grandfather. If the old tales are true, he who kills the Rougarou eventually becomes one.